Hello, Accelerators Organization. I'm Joel Gandara. Thanks for joining me for my live. I'm going to work on answering some questions that you guys have put together. And, you know, I was thinking right before we started here, I'm probably the only mentor in this organization or anywhere. We're probably the only one of you guys that does not have an office. I, I, I have a business and my employees have offices and mm -hmm. I don't have one. So I'm at home. I don't have a desk. I don't have a computer, so I'm working off my phone right now, and uh, I'm always like in a different room. I'm just sitting in the corner of my bedroom right now, so hopefully uh, lighting's good and you can hear me okay, and uh, it just goes to show. You can have a big fancy office and a computer and really just be spinning your wheels and not getting anything done. I feel like I can get a lot done just having a phone. First question comes from Zach Nock. How do you hold employees accountable when they lose? or misplace equipment in any dollar amount for a project. My company, Diamond State Technology, specializes in working with access control, automation, cameras, and security systems. The reason for my question is an employee of mine misplaced $700 in hardware, causing me to reorder the equipment for a loss of $700. When I worked for other alarm companies, they docked my pay until the equipment was that was lost was repaid. This seems unfair. Our equipment is pretty expensive and docking pay just doesn't sit right with me. Thank you, mentors, for your irreplaceable knowledge and thank you for making time to answer my question. Zach, um, so I have these conversations of what's fair and not fair with my kids all the time. And um, so I'd like to hear, and it's funny because you're in my forum, my AO forum, so I'm going to hear it today and we can actually cover this one today when we get together. What is fair? If, if you have me hold something of yours and I lose it, is it fair that I replace what I lost? Especially when you're paying me for holding it. I think it's very fair to dock pay. I mean, should you, is it fair that you lose the money? Uh, I have, I have, I'm on the opposite side of that. It just doesn't sit right with me that you have to lose the money. You're employing this person. You're making them responsible with some equipment and then they lose it. And oh well, that's your problem because you're the owner. That almost sounds like a socialist perspective to me. Not that you are one, but uh, it's kind of weird. These are adults and they're responsible and you're assigning them something. And uh, here's the thing. If you, don't th if you think it's unfair to charge them, I don't know why you would ask the question, right? You would just say, well, as the owner, it's my responsibility and I'll just keep swallowing all the bad problems in the business that employees cost. In this particular one, I do not have a personal experience share where I can tell you, yep, I have employees who did this and this and I docked their pay. But I do have uh, someone who worked with me for eight years. He was my right-hand man who ran the show for years. He had a landscaping company before and they had a lot of employees and they had a lot of equipment and they kept losing equipment constantly and breaking it and just throwing it in the truck. I mean, just damaging everything. And then they made a new rule and they said, when you damage or lose equipment that is signed out to you every morning, it comes out of your pay. Guess what happened? You know what happened? Nobody lost anything. Nobody broke anything. They now felt responsible. So this is just like with children. If you let them get away with something over and over, guess what? They don't care. It doesn't matter. The moment they feel it, then that happens. I'll give you an example. So I do have an example personally, and it happened last week. My daughter wanted a dog and I did not want a dog. I didn't want a pet. I didn't want to complicate my life. I've never had a pet and I made it to last year, 44 years old without a pet in my life. And well, she begged and cried and gave me the silent treatment and she got a dog during COVID. We were home a lot. There wasn't as much to do. So we went ahead and got a dog. And as you can imagine, she played with the dog and it was the love of her life for about two weeks. And then it's dwindled down since then. And so the dog is a great dog and he doesn't do anything bad except for remote controls. That's like his vice. It's his drug of choice. If he sees a remote control, he will chew on it and break it. And he's now broken uh, two Alexa or three Alexa remote controls. And the last one, the whole family had been warned. If you're the person who leaves the remote control where it does not go, and the dog gets to it and bites it, you will pay the $40 for the new remote control. And for, I don't know, six months, the kids have been perfect. They go to the couch, 
They open up the section of the couch that has a big door. They put the remote in there and they close it. Uh, the other day, my daughter did not. And so she's nine years old. And last weekend, she made about $60 profit in lemonade stand money. Well, guess what 40 of those dollars went to? I had to go take it out of the, her savings pouch that she uses to save until she goes to the bank. And I had to take the $40 and put it in my pocket in front of her, you know, and show her that, well, as agreed. And, you know, she cried and got sad. And I go, yeah, but this is fair. And, I, and in the end, I got her to agree that, yes, it's very fair. Otherwise, everybody leaves them out. What, I have to do this? I didn't want the dog. And I shouldn't be buying the remote controls. So hope that helps. I'm sure you'll do ultimately what you think is right. You're a smart guy. All right, next question is from Rohit Gupta. What's the best way to price products? What margins do we set prices at? Need help with pricing products, first time business owner. Okay, Rohit, so we do not exist in a bubble. We are in a market, it's a free market, and people are gonna set prices, and it's all ultimately, the most beautiful thing about this world is that it's market driven. People vote with their dollars, and whatever people think the price should be, that's what the price is, right? And they prove that because if, if the price is too expensive, no one will buy. And if the price is too low, you're going to sell a ton of them. However, if it's too low, you might not make money or you definitely won't make as much as you could. So here's what I've done for that. And, and I'm in a product-based business that we take a cost, we multiply it to get to our price. Um, I take a look at what the market's doing. So if the market is selling this shirt for $28, I am not going to shoot, just my approach, I'm not going to shoot to sell this for $29 or more. I want to sell it for less than $28. I don't even want to sell for $28. There's already somebody in that price point. I want to beat it. So number one, I make sure that the quality is just as good or better, that I have stock and I can deliver quickly, and that um, my price is better. Right? If I could do all of those things, I think I'll be in a better situation going forward. And... But see, I do see this a lot of times, so I'm really glad you're asking this now. I see people take do what's called Keystone, where they'll buy something for 10 and they'll sell it for 20. That might be okay if you can sell like thousands a day or something, but, but that's usually not enough of a markup. In, in my apparel businesses, we mark up a lot more than that. And then we have discounts and promotions and loyalty points that drive that debt price down a little bit. But look for a good markup. Uh, look and see what's normal. And, and, and find out as much as you can. So hopefully it's an industry that you know something about, right? So if it's jewelry, maybe it's three times markup. If it's apparel, it could be four or five times. But if it's other things, it might be one times markup or half the markup of one time. So look at the industry that you're in. I hope you learn as much as you can about it and find out what's normal. See what the price in the market is and then go backwards. Say, okay, this thing sells for $20. How much can I get it made for? Hopefully five. So I'm going to dig, dig, dig till I can find someone here who'll sell it to me for five. And then great. I get to keep the 15 in between. Hope that helps. Next question is from AJ Couts. How do you build a plan to reach your goal? He goes on to say, Sean's group post today challenged me to consider my plan of reaching $1 million in revenue for our online marketing agency. I don't have much of a plan beyond an annual goal of 10000 a month in revenue and a figure-it-out mindset. Not having a strong plan is clearly holding me back. I want to build this business. I want, to be, I want it to be successful. I want to have the cash flow to take weekend trips to AO meetings without feeling guilty. How do I begin laying the groundwork for that growth? So AJ, the, your why sounds like you're developing it, right? You know why you want to have success and why you want to make good money because you want to leave uh, your, your business and go to events like the AO meetings at Sean's and elsewhere uh, without feeling guilty and to know that, that you can afford those things. Well, a plan, I, I, what I've done with companies that I just did this uh, less than a week ago. So sat with a real estate company, the two owners, and I've done it with other companies too, but we sit down and we whiteboard and we block off four hours and we talk about on the whiteboard, tell me about the company today and we'll list all the things that the company's, what it is today, where the revenue's at, who the employees are, all this stuff. And then we're going to jump forward. And if your plan is three years from now, four years from now, five years, two years, whatever it is, 
we're going to write what the company would look like and what it would be doing at that time. So in your case, you can say, okay, the plan in two years, and we're just brainstorming here. We're just getting thoughts and ideas on a whiteboard. Um, so you might say, two years from now, I want to be at a million dollars. Well, what will that require? In an online marketing agency, that's going to require to add this position and then this one. And maybe we make a responsibility chart and we say, well, it'll, it'll be me here as a visionary and the CEO. It'll be here as the integrator. We're going to have this person running, uh, you know, paid ads and, and SEO and, you know, all the different things. And we're going to visualize that. We're going to actually write it out. And then we're going to talk about, you know, what your life would be like when you get to a million dollars. Well, that means you're going to start doing, I don't know, 10 weekend getaways where you go away for 10 weekends in the year and and one trip a year where you'll be gone for three weeks and you might leave the country and you might so we're going to go through all those things and then when it's all pretty and drawn up and there it is yep that's exactly what we want to do now the real work starts and then we start saying okay what do we have to do first to start getting to that okay well i'll give you an example the team that i met with recently in the last week uh, they have a lot of remote employees, but they'd like to get them together physically. So now it's begin planning that that thing. The other one is the local employees in our area. They want to get together with them once a month for lunch. So boom, the, all these were action steps that had to be developed. And then, and when I say action steps, this is not go on a piece of paper. The human nature is that yeah, let me write a to do list. I don't have to do list. I have a calendar. So on the spot, right there, one of the two owners this week when we met or the other day put it all in his, in his calendar, shared it with his business partner, shared it with me. Now I see the plan. I know it's being executed on. They have the accountability from a coach. They have it with each other and it will be done, right? So that's the difference. I recently met with a company, the owner, a 37 year old company, the owner and his two key executives flew in and we did this. We did it for four hours. And they told me at the beginning of the meeting, that they've done these planning sessions and nothing has ever happened. They've hired consultants and they've done all these things. I knew things would happen when we did it together. And now we've since met, that was a couple of months ago, we've since had our regular routine coaching calls with the executive team and they all agree that yes, things are happening. And the reason is that last step that I said. So remember, here's, what it, here's how I do it. Where are we today? And we write all that out, the good, the bad, the ugly, all the things. Where do we want to be in one, two, three, four, five years, whatever that is, and what the revenue is, what employees we'll need, what office we'll have, what kind of customers we we'll visualize that whole thing on paper or on the board. And then lastly, what's the action plan to get there? Mm -hmm. And I really hold them accountable and I make them stick to that plan. And it works. It really works. So AJ, I hope that guides you along in the right direction. By the way, one of those companies that I've done this exact same thing with in the last six months that flew in was an online uh, marketing agency. So. It can be done with any business. I always hear things like, well, my business is different. They're not. No business is different in, in, when it comes to planning and strategy and executing. All right. Next question is from Quaid Sturdy. What are the essential business systems all organizations need to thrive? I'm trying to scale my construction business as fast as possible. However, I must maintain a strong foundation. I would like to know what the most vital pillars are to build from the start? Quaid, I gotta tell you, that is the most vague question. <laughs> Put yourself in my spot. I read this question. It, what are the essential business systems all organizations need to thrive? And systems, does that mean like an inventory system, a time management system? Um, I don't really, workflow, I, I don't really know what this question means. So let's try to, trying to scale my construction business as fast as possible. Okay, great. However, I must maintain a strong foundation. Not sure what that means. I'd like to know what the most vital pillars are to build from the start. I wish I could answer it. I'm not trying to be difficult. Uh, that's a tough question. It needs to go into more details. These questions really need to give a little bit of a story. You know, you see some of these other questions before. Uh, they really give more detail. Wish I could answer it. I could start spewing words, but I would just try to be trying to guess. Feel free to reach out to me. You can reach me on Facebook or wherever and and with more details and i'll try my best to answer that kristen pitts asks what type of pos system do you recommend using to track inventory or should we keep keep things as is is there a big enough benefit to a uniform system should we invest in one to supply to all of our shops majority of our golf course owners are older and don't want to upgrade their systems 
Some courses are more up to date and would be open to it. If it makes sense to upgrade, how would you handle a change like this for our course owners? What's in it for them? Thank you for your time. We merchandise 13 golf pro shops. The golf course owners outsource their shops to us to handle and they get a 15% cut of the profit sold. They write us a check each month for our 85%. We deliver, set up, remove old products, etc. Our staff is delivering and warehousing. We do not have staff at shops. They use their, their staff, golf pros, etc. to sell products. Each shop has their own POS system to handle everything in their course, including tea times, our retail, food sometimes, etc. Every course is unique. Some of them have created their own SKU number for our products. Others have just one single button for our products. A physical count inventory is done each month. We track everything on Excel to email and invoice each month. Kristen, I see what you're doing. Your business sounds super creative that you're in that space, that you're supplying the inventory to these golf shops at the golf courses, and you're bringing it in, inventorying it, counting it, picking it up, all of that. And they provide the labor, the four walls and the roof and, and go from there. The downside of this is, you know, golf, I'm sure, you know, you may have a different opinion, but I live in a golf course community and I see membership is down tremendously. Golf is a dying sport. And, and part of that, obviously, there's a lot of other entertainment and there's a lot more active sports that people are into. You look at the 1970s, not too many people jogged and rode bikes compared to golf back then. But now you look at, you know, all the extreme sports that people do. So it's a tough industry to be in, but it's because of what you said that made me think that. It's that a lot of the owners are older and they're set in their ways and they don't really want to update systems. You're going to confuse them. You might bring them Toast or Square or the, a really cool, easy to use POS system and they might tell you, uh, we do it this way because that's the way we've always done it, which is like, that makes me cringe every time I hear it, but I hear people say that. So do you want to make the investment at your dime to install all of that, to make sure they buy in and they use it? Because imagine the worst case scenario. You buy all of this. They all you, you convince them all to take on a POS system, point of sales system that you install and paid for and everything. And then they revert to their old ways. Right, They start using their old computer, their old system, using one SKU for all your products. That's horrible inventory management. Um, using one button for all of your products, horrible. So you got to think about it. You're, you're, it would make your life easier, obviously. Your thinking is right. You're going to be on the right, in the right direction because you're going to have proper reporting, proper inventory. You're going to see what's selling, what needs to be reordered. Um, I don't have physical locations, but I did look at buying a store uh, in our industry, a very well-established store that... that that I think could have gotten us to another level as far as presence and done all these things. So I did go down that route of looking at these things. And I don't know if it's out there, but we would have written software where every sale of the day gets turned into a purchase order for our warehouse, all right, our central warehouse that will then twice a week or so deliver everything that needs to be re stocked into the store so you don't have to have a buyer you don't have to send a person out to each of those shops to write down because i used to be a sales rep when i first started my business i would go to boutiques that i would sell to and count their inventory and write up my own orders it was horrendous so if you i like what you're thinking if you can automate all of this it would be phenomenal but you have a big barrier in front of you it's to convince all these independent store owners right you're just a vendor to them now you got to convince them all hey change the system you use and let me train you on that. That's the other one. You're going to train all of these people on that when a lot of them are probably on their way out. Have you considered buying them out if you really believe in that industry and think there's a future there? You have an in, in with these people. Uh, the businesses I've bought to date, as of today, I've bought 14 businesses. 13 of them were not for sale. And I approached them and built relationships because we were in business, doing business together for many years. You have an opening. You have, how many stores did you say? 13 golf pro shops. I'm sure there's one of them that wants to sell the business. Is that something you're interested in? If not, maybe you can help them find a better buyer who can run it better and will use your system. The other thing is, would you be willing to do this one store at a time, right? So the one that's a slam dunk for sure, who wants to do it, convince them, hopefully on their dime, to switch over. You're going to have a better system, better inventory management. And if not, um, then you put it in and you test it. Or do you have to do it widespread for the whole chain of 13? So that's that's something to consider. But I like it, I like what you're thinking, and hopefully it works out. All right, Kristen. All right, everybody, thank you for your time. This was quick, we only had a few questions, one of which I was not able to answer, unfortunately. All right, guys, I wish you the best.